the last 10 years, Shanghai has reinvented her future after a long hibernation, since 1949, when the communists took over and put her to sleep. Now she longingly gazes out across the Pacific Ocean like an unfulfilled mistress shackled to a slow and obtuse lover. As a Western invention with a dubious colonial past, this trading port situated at the mouth of the great Yangtze River is the pretty face of China today. Like most big cities, Shanghai has a magnetism that can keep you hostage and gobble up your money. So we beat a hasty retreat into the densely populated surrounding countryside in search of a more authentic China. According to a famous Chinese proverb, Suzhou, the Venice of the East, is an earthly paradise. Although swimming in the moat that surrounds the city can cause grave illness, it still is a place of great beauty. Suzhou is one of the oldest towns on the Yangtze floodplains. Throughout its 2,500-year history right up to the present day, it has been famous as a prosperous silk production center. Strewn around town there are many factories like this one. They all produce high quality silk fabric in a process which begins with a bag of cocoons as it comes in the back door and ends in marvelous embroidered garments walking out the front. Embroidered by hand? Yes. As a husband and wife team we travel light and have no crew or squeamish companions to consider at meal times. Although bottled bar top potions, said to enhance a man's potency, can test any normal appetite, there is always something edible to be found among all the gastronomical audacity. Mm. The whole eastern side of China bristles with crafts and culture, and while Suzhou, like the rest of China, is being swept away by a flood of urban renewal, some of its old world charm still remains. This factory produces traditional fans that are crafted into stunning works of art with the use of very simple tools. The wood they use is sandalwood and the whole room is filled with the divine fragrance it exudes. A staggering amount of work goes into each unique fan and it isn't surprising to learn that they do not come cheap. For about 100 US dollars, it is possible to buy one of these elegant devices that with a flick of the wrist instantly turns old stale air into exquisitely scented breezes. With such an abundance of skilled artisans around, and given the fact that the Chinese love tea so much, it seems natural that the serving vessels themselves should have evolved into their own art form. Owning a teapot made from the special fine grain clay that can only be found here in Yixing is apparently a sure sign of superior taste. This one costs about 8,000 US dollars, but there are cheaper ones for the frugal. For about a tenth of the price, you can buy one from a lesser-known artist employed by the factory. A large proportion of teapots from this factory are exported to Europe each year. Quality control is strict and each person specializes in one specific design in order to ensure a uniform standard. After the initial shaping and firing at very high temperatures, the finished items are subjected to further scrutiny. By lightly tapping it, the quality of the ring it emits will determine whether a pot will leave the premises or end up in the trash can. The next day we stumble upon this restaurant thinking that we have found the right place to eat the fish that we've been craving for the last few days. 
It is impossible to speak to anyone, so I resort to our trusted phrase book. When they bring us this, I'm certain that we have not expressed ourselves well, and it takes some time before it is decided that the snake should go back to where it came from. While we are standing around in morbid fascination, it dawns on us that the place only caters for people with a taste for wildly exotic creatures. What shocks me most is that someone has disrespectfully flicked a burning cigarette into the cage of this unfortunate animal waiting to be slaughtered. We're curious to know how many snakes they actually have and make our way into the kitchen to see where they keep them. There are many. Bundles of snakes are cooped up in these cages waiting to be eaten by people who believe they'll get some kind of power if they do. It is true that what you eat is learnt behaviour and that it is only your preference which prevents you from eating snakes. What is sad though is that there is a serious lack of any of this apparent abundance of wildlife visible outside in the little bit of nature that is left. Respect for mother nature seems to be replaced by an obsession with virility and power. Apparently a snake's gallbladder swallowed whole can change your life. As a textile designer, I'm keen to find out more about indigo dye. So we start inquiring along our way at various shops and department stores that sell indigo products. The town of Nantong, a few hours away, seems to be where most people think we'll be able to find a small factory that produces high quality indigo cloth. With limited words and lots of patience, these girls eventually understand what we're on about and give me an address written in Mandarin to show around once we get to Nantong. The indigo dye factory that I'm looking for turns out to be quite famous in Nantong and it isn't difficult to find. They are very happy to show us around and I'm ecstatic to see things that I'd only seen and read about in books. Reusable stencils are employed to create the designs they need. By spreading a soybean and lime paste over the stencils, it is possible to prevent the dye from penetrating certain areas of the design printed on the calico cloth. There are two types of indigo dye. One is an organic vegetable dye that is used in the more remote rural areas, while the other, like the one used here, is its synthetic cousin. Both give the same result and are prepared according to very specific recipes. The cloth is immersed in the dye several times to make sure that the microscopic indigo particles fix themselves thoroughly onto the fibers. This is the, the paste that resists the indigo dye. And you can see how beautifully it does it. After the long strips of cloth have dried, the last remaining step is to remove the hardened paste. This is when the cloth comes alive. Mr. Wu, the owner of the factory, also kindly shows me how they do tie-dyeing. Painstakingly, the cloth, or silk in this instance, is folded several ways and tied with string. When it goes into the bath, the folded areas resist the indigo dye and create a small flower. Extremely intricate designs are possible with this technique when producing silk scarves. Breaking these knots is like bursting bubble wrap, only better because of the beautiful designs that pop out. To be talking of rural areas in the whole eastern side of China is somewhat strange because almost everywhere it is built up. 
Only small pockets of land is left between the buildings for people to farm on. This man, appearing to step from a much older world with his boat and cormorants, looks out of place for a moment. It is extremely rare to find this sort of thing nowadays, and we curiously follow him to see what he gets up to. It is a brilliant example of man and wild animals living together in a symbiotic relationship, where he agrees to take them to the fish, while they promise to give him some when they get it. Or well, that is the plan. What he is doing now is taking a few youngsters out for a training session so that they all know what to expect when the real fishing starts. It looks like the most normal thing for the birds to do as they sit on the boat like fair paying customers on a bus. By attaching rings around their throats, the birds are prevented from swallowing the fish they catch. The fisherman then retrieves the fish and shares it out later. As a group of onlookers gathers, he glides off with his fine feathered family. It was time to head south to Guyang, capital of the less populated Gizo province. We had heard about the colorful culture of two minority groups, the Miao and the Dong, who live there and are hoping to see and explore some of their living traditions. A few days later we find ourselves standing in the middle of a fairy tale landscape with wooden houses hugging a mountain in a village called Langde. The Miao people who live here are rice farmers, with each household tending a small plot of land mainly to sustain themselves. It is the harvest season. Like busy bees, people are carrying loads of rice around that will be stored for consumption until next year's harvest. <laughs> On this particular evening, we eat like kings from a communal feast of chili, ginger, stirred fried pork, shredded potato and the inevitable steamed rice. After having travelled for a few days feeling uncertain of whether we would manage to find accommodation in Langde, we are relieved to find a hot meal and a small room. <coughs> the next morning we are back in paradise and we allow our eyes to meander slowly over the rich detail of the village architecture. It feels good to be away from the overcrowded Han Chinese areas of eastern China and to observe a lifestyle that seems more in tune with nature. The day's ritual starts early in the morning when the harvesting continues on the dried out paddies. Everyone is relaxed because the crops are good and there is enough time left to get it off the fields before planting for the next season has to begin. It is also time when the women start making and embroidering clothes for the New Year's festival, sometime in October after the first full moon when the harvesting is done. This is a traditional baby carrier used by all the women in the area to carry their babies around in. And it's beautifully hand decorated and lined with indigo hand woven cloth at the back. Exquisitely decorated. Miao people are animists, believing in gods who guard over different aspects of life. 
Ceremonies are frequently held in the village square to appease wrathful guards and to ask for abundant crops and everlasting peace. The home is believed to be sacred. It is for protection that objects of religious significance are attached above all doors and near a family's crops. The Miao knows that although the wheel of life turns slowly, misfortune can strike like lightning. As the lush landscape rushes by, I sit and marvel over the effectiveness of the local transport while I quietly go over the details of our insurance in my head. We pass through countless villages on our way to Shenzhen, further south, and everywhere we look, people seem to be working like ants. <coughs> I have seen many different ways of spinning cotton before, but never anything as spectacular as what this lady is about to do. Over many hundreds of years, the quest for greater efficiency has led to the development of this contraption, which spins two threads simultaneously. I reckon that with the kind of coordination that is required here, you could fly a helicopter with ease. With the rice harvest nearly over, many women switch over to their other jobs. They are also enormously skilled craftspeople who produce cloth for their entire families for the following year. Even sometimes enough to sell. The sound of working looms can literally be heard from door to door as I walk through the village. Without a single understandable word being spoken, we are invited for lunch by a woman who volunteers to show us around. At first, I don't realize that what she is going to feed us is actually sitting at the bottom of that wooden vat, with all the mold growing on top of the flirt in it. I don't quite know if I'm still going to be around by the time she gets to the edible part, and I hold my breath as she proceeds to pour out the sharp-smelling broth. The friendly smiles of the kids makes me relax slightly and I realize that we are honored to be invited into their home. It isn't anything new really. The preserving of food has been standard practice for hundreds of years before any fridge came along. In fact, none of the houses that I have been in had such an appliance anyway. When a few tightly packed fishes are finally lifted from their chilly tomb, I quietly pledge that I will eat without hesitation. I sense that she would never have opened it if she didn't consider it a special gesture of goodwill. As the fish sizzles in the wok, it smells fantastic and I don't worry anymore. Between the red venom of the chili, the heat of the fire and my arsenal of strong medicine, I feel safe enough. The next morning I notice young women in traditional dress arriving in nearby Ronjiang to sell their vegetables. This is exactly why people here don't need fridges, they only buy enough fresh ingredients for the day's meals. We have an early appointment to see a lady in Chejiang who is going to show us the process of dyeing with natural indigo. <coughs> When we finally get there, we cannot grasp why she suddenly seems reluctant. It takes a while for her to convey that she has had second thoughts and now feels hesitant to reveal ancestral secrets. I cannot help but admire her for wanting to protect her hard-earned knowledge. There is a strong belief among ethnic minorities farming in southern China that indigo-dyed clothing can repel snakes and insects lurking in the rice paddies. In 1929, Chairman Mao elevated this homogenous blue uniform of the peasants into a symbol of the communist movement. As we travel deep into the remote farming areas, it becomes clear that most villages have plenty of rice for both food and a surplus for selling. Valleys are terraced and every natural resource used to its maximum. This unassuming wooden house is what could be called the engine room of the surrounding settlements.
By making use of the kinetic energy of the strong flow of water that is in abundance, they are able to power this huge wooden machine that breaks open the husks containing the rice grains. It is simple but ingenious. The continuous transfer of energy onto the cogwheel under the shed keeps the millstone going for free. This means less labor and more time for other tasks. Occasional rain signal the approach of summer. This woman is calendaring the cotton she has woven to prevent surface rub off of the indigo, giving it a crisp, polished look. An added bonus is that it allows water to roll off its shiny surface when getting wet. Young leaves from indigo-bearing plants are fermented in a vat. During this process, enzymes transform the fermenting plant material into indigo. Alkaline substances like ash from burnt rice stalks turns insoluble indigo into a solution in which dyeing can take place. Once the cloth emerged from the bath, the floating indigo particles are oxidized back into their original insoluble state, creating the famous blue color that is now permanently bonded with the cloth. Indigo, which gave birth to the phrase blue collar worker, is the oldest dye known to man. Over centuries it has spawned many myths and legends and has survived until today as a living tradition handed down from one generation to the next. <laughs> At the center of each Dong village is a drum tower. Although sacred, it is also where people socialize around the fire pit. This man is fattening up his water buffalo for the bullfighting that will take place during the New Year festival, which occurs in October after the full moon. We are very keen to attend the much-awaited New Year's celebration and decide to make our way to another village called Shidong, which is reputed to have very lively festivals during this time. In the days leading up to the festival, I'm invited to various houses to see preparations taking place. Today I'm taken to meet the local jeweller, who supplies most of the ladies in the town with jewellery for the festival. Although his tools are primitive, he still manages to churn up the most delicate silver jewelry by hand. These are baby's bangles. I think it's for protection. Great care is taken to make sure that each part of the traditional dress for the festival is made immaculately. Despite many other tasks during the last few weeks, this woman has also managed to spin, weave and dye the most awesome skirt. I couldn't quite make out how she managed to create such perfect pleats in the stiff fabric until she showed me another one she was still busy finishing off. By painstakingly folding the cloth and tying it onto a barrel, she's able to manipulate each pleat to perfection. With a full moon obscured by rain clouds and the rice harvests in, their new year arrives.
From miles around, villagers have flocked to this distant valley to see the first water buffaloes getting ready for the traditional bullfights that mark the beginning of the two-day festival. It was hard to imagine these gentle beasts fighting while the punters were deciding on their favorites. Gratefully, I watch as the winner is stopped from finishing off his opponent. With many fights scheduled, the next two are quickly brought closer for the second fight. They look really charged up and as the tension mounts, the crowds are loving every second of it. Water buffalo are enormously valued and it rarely ever happens that they get seriously hurt. But I'm glad when the women get ready for the main event of dancing and showing off the costumes and jewellery that they've been preparing for this occasion for the last year. Although the music is monotonous and the dancing unspectacular, it is a powerful experience to share with all the colourfully dressed ladies. It is simply bewildering to study the detail of the women's costumes and to know that each millimetre was created by the proud wearer herself. The next morning we're off again. We head back to Guyang with a plan to go from there to Chengdu where we hope to see pandas. After Guyang and Chengdu, we want to leave China and enter the mountain kingdom of Tibet. Guyang and the whole of Gizo province was lucky to escape the brunt of Chairman Mao's disastrous cultural revolution, mainly due to the fact that it was sparsely populated and regarded as backward. Today the city has a wild frontier atmosphere where you find strange surprises around every corner. He seems to look after his performers reasonably well, but sadly there are not many animals left in the wild. In a gorge at the foot of Mount Eme in next door Sichuan province, it is possible to still find Tibetan macaques living freely. But the tourists have found them and are now literally loving them to death. <laughs> Every day, apart from visiting a few temples strewn around the huge sacred mountain, loads of mainly Chinese tourists flock to see these chubby-cheeked animals. What is threatening them now is an onslaught of food-bearing humans who are sending them to their grave. 
They have learned that they do not have to lift a finger to find food themselves and inevitably become obese and sick from their improper diet. As wave after wave of outstretched hands arrive, throughout the day, the macaques find it hard to keep up the munching. These people, in their ignorance, are more concerned about having a photo of themselves with the whatever you call it, rather than what the consequences of feeding them might be. What's more, they're assisted by eager official guides, who should know better. The whole affair seems very sad. For the macaques, it is a one-way street leading to extinction, while the humans are keeping all the laughs to themselves. At this popular tourist site, you can, for about 10 US dollars, release one of these birds. The Chinese are big on symbolism and don't really care that it doesn't do anything for the birds. Many will again be caught and brought back under the benevolent gaze of the Grand Buddha. This 71 meter high Buddha, built during the Tang dynasty over a thousand years ago, is the largest in the world. Because soil erosion threatens to reclaim him, officials are trying to come up with ways to protect it. One cunning plan is to cover the whole sculpture with a huge transparent shell. The giant panda breeding research center, a few kilometers outside Chengdu, has only recently been open to the public. About 15 adult pandas live here under the constant scrutiny of a posse of scientists. Through artificial insemination, they've managed to get these shy, cuddly creatures to breed. Unfortunately, mothers in captivity do not look after their young, and the offspring has to be hand-reared. Although it is not ideal to see them in what can, at best, only be described as a large zoo, it is nevertheless fantastic to come upon an instance where people are fighting the extinction of an animal. Sharing the same fate but not the limelight is the lesser panda. They're extremely shy and, in my opinion, even more adorable than their big designer cousins. Once you set eyes on these creatures, it's hard to imagine a world without them. On our way to Tibet, we fly over some of the most rugged terrain on Earth. Hopefully the animals that live there will be safe from their most feared enemy, man. Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, is at 3,600 meters above sea level, one of the highest cities in the world. The Potala Palace, once the seat of the Tibetan government and winter residence of the Dalai Lama, has fallen into disuse since 1959, when the 14th Dalai Lama escaped to India as China brutally invaded the country and liberated them from their independence. This statue celebrates 40 years of their dubious deliverance. Ironically, martial law was declared and all foreign press and tourists were banned at its unveiling on the 26th of May 1991. To this day, the Chinese cannot fathom the ingratitude of the Tibetans, who often rebel against their occupation. They feel that they have shown the Tibetans mercy by taking their land in exchange for roads, schools and hospitals. The Tibetans, on the other hand, are unable to forgive the vicious attack on their culture and the complete destruction of most of their monasteries. An estimated 1.2 million Tibetans died and about 100,000 people fled to India between 1950 and 1970.
40 kilometers outside Lhasa at the top of a very steep mountain pass, resolute monks are hard at work reconstructing Ganden Monastery after extensive destruction by artillery fire in 1966. In that year, the first Red Guards arrived with the intention of destroying the four olds, old customs, old culture, old habits and old thinking. But regardless of the many onslaughts, Tibetans have retained their enduring spirit. Over centuries, this harsh and inhospitable land has tempered the people into a resilient nation, able to withstand adversity and misfortune. These young men are reprinting from hand-carved wooden templates some of their religious Buddhist scriptures that was wantonly destroyed. It might have been a depressing scene were it not for the enthusiastic zeal with which they applied themselves to their task. Ganden, regardless of its sad history, is a cheerful monastery visited daily by scores of pilgrims who find solace in past spiritual leaders that are still held in high esteem. As I wander aimlessly around, I try to imagine how difficult it must have been for the Dalai Lama when he set off from here to live as an exile in India. Each monastery has around it a sacred circular route or kora, where on any given day groups of pilgrims are to be found walking and praying. This one is more than 600 years old and follows a path high up along the Kichu Valley. At first I cannot understand what these pilgrims are doing until I realize that they are selectively screening out parts of their vision to enable them to focus on specific elements of the rock. To my amazement, it turns out that they are reading holy inscriptions, said to have been written by a divine hand. This belief in miracles strikes me as very human. After all, most religions seem to have them in one form or another. Back in Lhasa, we hear about something that sounds very interesting, something that should be prescribed practice for any religion. It seems that large open-air debating sessions are held at Sera Monastery daily, just as they are at most monasteries. This is where serious issues of faith are debated until a conclusion is achieved, at which point the clapping of hands signals mutual consensus. It took us a while to organize a vehicle to take us for a few days on a round trip through Tibet. By now I have acclimatized to the high altitude. It's almost 4,000 meters above sea level, which means you can become short of breath very quickly or develop splitting headaches. that a breakdown in this dry and inhospitable land can be very serious as we all eat dust. Fortunately, our driver is prepared and in no time we are in Khyantse. <laughs> On the outskirts of the town, we come across this building project. During the rainy season a few months earlier, houses that were previously built here on the floodplains got washed away by unprecedented rainstorms. Now the same houses are being rebuilt in exactly the same spot. Everyone pitches in and several houses are built simultaneously using mud bricks and clay. 
Tibetan architecture is a combination of simplicity and aesthetic beauty. Each house sports a very elaborate front door, delicately carved with enormous detail. Once you start looking, surprising skills pop up everywhere. This man is making shoes next to the road using wool in the old traditional way. Women only. Yeah, so he's making the shoes for his wife. The staple diet of the Tibetan people is barley, the only crop that is successfully grown by subsistence farmers on the high plateau. During the late 60s, communist policy had most villages divided into collective work units that were dictated to about what was to be planted and when. It soon flopped and caused large-scale famine, forcing the Chinese government to drop the plan like a hot potato. <laughs> Today, the farmers are left to work the land the way they know best, and there is enough to eat for the estimated 2.3 million people who mainly live in rural areas. In an attempt to find more profitable ways to develop the Tibetan economy, the Chinese government has sought and recently found rich deposits of gold and other precious metals. Mining has now begun in earnest. Many Tibetans, including the Dalai Lama, are objecting to this because they see it as a plundering of nice. sacred soil. Long before sunrise, we are rudely awakened by blaring propaganda from these loudspeakers mounted on a hilltop in the middle of Shigatse, the second biggest city in Tibet. Apart from being told what to think and how to behave, the Tibetans are facing a much bigger threat to their dream of independence. Similar to what is taking place in other ethnic minority areas in China, the Tibetans are becoming crowded out by Han Chinese, who have been offered incentives by the Chinese government to resettle here. The Brahmaputra River is a lifeline that winds its way along the length of southern Tibet. Were it not for Norbu the ferryman, crossing this fast-flowing mass of water could be difficult. He will fetch people in his yak-skin boat as many times as he is needed in a day. <coughs> With 16 people and their luggage aboard, the boat hardly shows any sign of overload. The skin is stretched over a sturdy wooden rib cage and will last many years if properly maintained. Norbu's strategy for crossing is to first go upstream and then to shoot across using the current. <coughs> For a moment you cannot tell whether the things around his neck are talisman for luck or medals for bravery as he skims along the surface with confident ease. Further downstream, along one of the Brahmaputra River's many powerful tributaries, these people are making blocks from sandalwood pulp. And this is the machine that does all the work. Powered by water, an arm works like a piston with a sandalwood stump at the end. After the blocks are dried in the sun, they're taken to Lhasa to be sold to factories that produce incense for a nation who use it prodigiously as offerings in monasteries and temples. Okay. Okay. 
Definitely the most prominent religious structure in all of Tibet is the Yokhang Temple. It has undergone many renovations throughout the centuries, but the basic layout is ancient. Originally, Buddhism arrived here from India, replacing the shamanistic Bon faith. Although Buddhism was practiced long before in its neighboring countries, Tibet has become the most devout Buddhist nation in the world. Before the Chinese took over, Tibet was governed as a theocracy with the Dalai Lama as leader. His position cannot be earned by merit, but is inherited through reincarnation in much the same way as Western hereditary royal lineages. Tibetans are deeply religious people, and Buddhism filters through all aspects of their daily life. In order to make any sense of Tibetan culture, a basic understanding of Buddhism is needed. It is an ascetic faith that renounces the self. Suffering, they believe, is caused by desire that can be conquered by following the holy path. Food given as an offering to feed hungry pilgrims earns merit for those who contribute. For foreigners, concepts like merit, monkhood, pilgrimage and the sanctity of nature may seem strange, but they have shaped the culture of people living here on the Tibetan plateau. Life is seen as a continuous sequence of rebirths determined by karma, the consequence of one's actions. All beings are fated to tread this wheel of life until a commitment to enlightenment is made. Although the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 for his efforts to bring peace to his people, he is denounced by the Chinese as a troublemaker. For now, the Tibetans are on their own as the Chinese claim on Tibet goes unchallenged by the rest of the world. But while the actions of governments and political bickering makes the news, people create the fire in the drama of life. And that is what we came for. A church in Bunda Lamandrosi, Oyala Yala 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 Yala